Hello, and welcome back to the Bullspec Interviews video podcast. I'm Sam Montgomery Blinn, editor and publisher at Bullspec, and I'm very pleased to be here with John Kessel, um, who is a professor of, of creative writing and of science fiction and, and fantasy here at uh, North Carolina State University at the MFA program. Thanks, John, very much for sitting down with us. Um, my pleasure. All right. Well, we've got so much to talk about. You've, you've written and edited several things uh, recently, and, um, but I'm going to start by going way back, way back into 2001. Um, where you, you wrote an essay, Imagining the Future, which uh, you've been gracious enough to let us reprint in the next issue of Bull Spec. Um, it was a very interesting uh, essay when I read it. But since 2001, there's been nearly a decade of additional research on the science side and additional writing on the science fiction side. And I wondered if you've um, followed along and if you have any other um, kind of comments of, of mm -hmm. kind of almost a post-singularity kind of perspective that we may have gotten to. Well, I don't know if, uh, you know, uh, I guess people might have will have seen the essay in the magazine, or maybe they haven't, but it's a, the essay, there's a talk I gave at uh, the National Science Foundation did a, a conference at the Field Museum in Chicago uh, on imagining the future. And um, I, I was uh, asked to do this talk, and, and I talked about the singularity, and, uh, you know, singularity has been talked about in science fiction and other areas, computers, f for like almost 20 years now. Uh, um, Werner Vinge wrote an essay about this, I think it was 1993, and where he um, originated the term anyway. Mm -hmm. And the idea that, you know, there's going to be sometime in the next 30, 40 years a, a moment when uh, a machine intelligences exceed human and, or uh, other people include in that some bio-engineered uh, uh, changing of the human genome. But there'll be some point at which the human race will be altered or human experience will be altered beyond which we cannot see what things will be like. And uh, so my essay was actually taking that idea, but, but also talking about um, uh, the history of science fiction and the idea of these sort of evolutionary or, or uh, conceptual leaps, and, but also looking at them in the, in the, in the moral the context of morality. I gave this talk about a, a month and a half after 9-11 and uh, on my mind was the fact that um, technologically we have advanced immensely fast in the last 200 years, um, morally and ethically, not so much. And, uh, you know, many people, I'm not the first, have raised the question about whether um, we can handle the powers that are given to us by advancing technology with a kind of, you know, hominid, uh, evolutionarily uh, uh, restricted uh, uh, ethical uh, um, capacity. And uh, and H.G. Wells and others talked about this as a problem. Um, so I thought, well, well there, could there be a singularity for, for a, a moral or ethical singularity as well? Hmm. Anyway, uh, so uh, as, far, as regards to singularity, you know, I, I'm not a, a completely a cutting edge uh, person in, as regards uh, the technology of, of uh, artificial intelligences and things like that. I have to say that, despite the fact that I uh, gave this talk, I'm kind of a skeptic about the singularity. I, uh, uh, such such things as Moore's law, uh, you know, Moore's law says like, what is it? The computing capacity uh, doubles every eighteen months. Eighteen months. I probably got that wrong. Well, <laughs> see, I have a problem with that. I, I was a, a physics major, and whenever someone comes up with a, a, a term that they call a law, I, I want to know. A law is something that's inherent in the in the nature of the universe, like you know the law of gravity, or you know a uh, structural law. Uh, it's a law that can't be violated. Okay, it's not a matter of opinion. It's not a matter of. It's not dependent on our our uh, state of technological development. Physical laws are physical laws. Mm -hmm. Moore's law is not a physical law. It's just something somebody observed about the the sort of local advancement of processing technology over a, a period that goes back maybe twenty years. Okay, well, that's not a law, okay? Uh, you know, you could say that uh, if you extrapolated the sort of the top velocity that a human being can travel at, mm -hmm. starting in 1900 and going up to 1965 or 1970, uh, the top velocity a human being could travel at in 1900 is maybe 100 or 120 miles an hour in a railroad train, okay? By 1970, we could go, uh, you know, 25,000 miles an hour and go to the moon. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you extrapolate that trend, right now we're going 60 times the speed of light. <laughs> not quite. No, we're not. Okay, that's not a law. So Moore's law, I think, is BS. Okay, <laughs> uh, I'll say that right now. All of you computer people, Moore's law is BS. And so the idea that, that the sing if the singularity depends on Moore's law, I'm skeptical. Okay. okay? 
so uh, you know, you mentioned that, that uh, Vinji himself has wondered, well, what might happen if the singularity didn't didn't right, occur? Right, right. And, and so, you actually put a great story on that front, um, uh, Calorie Man by Paolo Bacigalupi. Right. In, a, in your Rewired anthology, and I was, I had just read Wind Up Girl, which is kind of a continuation of that right. story, which imagines directly that scenario of the singular doesn't happen, right. all this other stuff happens. Right, and, and uh, Bacigalupi is absolutely a skeptic about our ability to deal with the technological, uh, the results of our technological advances. And morally, too. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, I hope we can uh, advance uh, enough to be able to, you know, the singularity is sort of, a, uh, it's like an apotheosis. So the idea that somehow our problems will be solved because, you know, intelligence is greater than our own will we'll take care of it. And... Um, I hope it happens. Uh, I hope that those intelligences are uh, ethically more advanced than we are. But, um, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's not been our history. So, so uh, I, haven't really, I, I haven't really kept up with the, the, the latest things. I've been reading science fiction, and, and a lot of science fiction is, uh, there's been a lot of science fiction that's tried to deal with, uh, you know, the singularity or post-singularity world. Uh, things like, uh, you mentioned Charles Strauss, mm -hmm. his uh, Accelerando stories. They're really cool. I really like them. Uh, you know, um, um, Cory Doctorow, uh, other, uh, a lot of other writers have tried to tried to deal with this. Um, you know, my friend James Patrick Kelly has done some sort of post singularity stories. Um, I don't know, you know, how I feel about that. I think it's it's definitely worth speculating about. I don't know. Um, I've just read uh, Bruce Sterling's uh, novel, The Caryatids. It came out at the end of last year and didn't get much talk, but it's really pretty pretty interesting. It talks about you know. Uh, it's set in the in the late 21st century, and it deals with a lot of the uh, extrapolating a lot of the difficulties we're having now, uh, environmentally and technologically, into the and politically into this future, uh, which is a mess, and and, and uh, a sort of a post-catastrophe future where civilization hasn't collapsed by any means, but it's it, it, the people are struggling to deal with uh, the there but but sterling does not postulate any kind of you know godlike super intelligences that that sort of save our bacon in the story we're we're we're, we're stuck with what we got yeah we're on our own we have to actually solve the problem not hope in 30 years we can solve the problem right right we'll so, see okay um so that's probably enough about the distant past uh, <laughs> let's talk about the future briefly uh, the near future um, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you was you're coming to Durham in, um, in a short while to uh, give a talk about Wicked. Yeah. Uh, the, the Durham Performing Arts Center is bringing some musicals through town at kind of the upper scale, and Wicked's coming. And, and it's going to be interesting to see what you have to say comparing Wicked um, to the original Oz stories. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the original Oz books. Uh, Frank Baum, L. Frank Baum, um, who wrote The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, uh, then wrote 13 others, uh, sequels, and uh, they elaborate a great deal on the world of Oz. Uh, it gets very complicated, and there are certain re there are recurring characters and, and uh, the different the geographies of Oz and, and all this other stuff. And it's really quite, quite fun to read and, and fascinating. Uh, Baum was, a, I think he was an idealist and a social reformer. You know, he wanted to see a utopian world, and Oz is sort of a utopian world. I mean, except for the, the Wicked Witch of the West and her sister, the Witch of the East, who die in the first book, thanks to Dorothy. I don't think in any of the other 13 books anyone ever dies or gets older. No one gets older. No one ages, no one dies. In fact, uh, later Dorothy brings Aunt Em and Uncle Henry to Oz with her. Uh, and uh, because they're old and frail, and when they get to Oz, they, they don't age anymore. They'll live forever. And, you know, there's a kind of a, I mean, you know, there's not really any explanation given for that in the stories, but it's really quite, a, I don't know, it's charming, really. And, and there's conflict in Oz, but there's not, you know, it's not the uh, brutal and, and homicidal conflict that we have in our world. Um, it's interesting. I read the, the the series of books as a child, as a, or as a very very young adult, right. and they're introduced kind of now as the Wonderful Wizard of Oz as a children's story. But originally, that was not Baum's idea. It was it was a kind of a, a grand allegory of science of science fiction or fantasy. It was is that kind of a lost art? You think? Do we see not not enough of that? Well, you know, I I it's funny. I was reading a lot of young adult fiction and children's fiction with my daughter when she was younger. Now she's older enough, and we're not doing that. But um, so I read a lot of contemporary uh, children's fiction, and 
some of it seems to me to be be serious. I don't know if it, it, it does this sort of grand allegory thing. I suppose you could say the, uh, you know, the Harry Potter books attempt to some kind of global vision of the of humanity, but I don't know. I don't think they, they you know, I like them well enough, but I, I don't think they're that, that uh, profound. Uh, the Oz books, um, I don't know. There's something about them that's very American. They, they, they don't owe anything at all to European fantasy, or not much. You know, it's not like they're sort of uh, uh, obliged to the feud. They're not. They're not feudal. Mm. Okay, they're not. Uh, not a uh, Brothers Grimm tale retold. No, by no, and, and even if you think about Tolkien, his his fantasy world of Middle Earth is very, very uh, feudal. Okay, it's it's uh, and it's based on European, you know, and British uh, uh, class structures. Okay, very much class is written into it, and that's not there in Oz. Oz is very American. You even have like a state university of Oz where Professor Wogglebug teaches. Uh, and, and so uh, uh, that's interesting to me. And, and the book Wicked takes some of that. And Wicked, of course, does something. I mean, it's like it's a very dark vision of Oz. And there is death and there mm -hmm. is tyranny and there is all this. He sort of flips everything around where all the values are upside down and, and the good people are bad and the bad people are good and, and uh, wicked. So that's a, uh, and a much more mature and complex characters, uh, which is interesting to me. But I, I sometimes feel that Wicked doesn't really, in some ways it's, you know, you could you go to Wicked and, and if you've seen the, the movie, The Wizard of Oz, that's as much as you need to know to understand Wicked, but you don't really get L. Frank Baum's Oz. You know, it's not really there in, in Wicked. And uh, so if you read, if reading the Baum books might be a big surprise. One thing that happens in the Baum books, actually it's pretty interesting, is that there are these, very strong women or girl characters. Girls, girls are always the the, the main characters, and and the, there are ma male characters, but the uh, the girls seem to Ozma and Dorothy and and General Ginger and other characters. Are, they're all the girls are the active and and assertive characters in the in the Oz books, and uh, the boys. Are the, the one boy who seems very important, and I think it's in the second book. His name is Tip. Have you read the second book? I read them. 20 yeah. years ago, perhaps. So. Well, it has that wonderful and absolutely st astonishing ending where Tip is the boy who's been raised by a witch and he escapes from her and, and he goes off. He's going to go off to, the, I think he's going to the Emerald City. And, uh, and he has a Jack Pumpkinhead who he's brought to life with some mm -hmm. powder of life. Well, at the end of the story, it turns out that uh, uh, Tip isn't a boy, that he's been, he's Princess Ozma. Who has been ca was captured by a witch and and mm -hmm. made into a boy and made to forget who she was, and so. Uh, but at the end of the story, you know, they tell him, well, you know, you're really not a boy. You're you Princess Ozma. He says, what? Oh, no, I'm not Princess Ozma. He says, yes, you are. You know, if you come in here, we'll unmagic you. And he goes into this tent and they unmagic him and he comes out and he's Ozma. And it's like, whoa. I mean, a kid, you know, would be just flabbergasted by that. This boy hero becomes a girl, and that's the happy ending. <laughs> that's interesting. That's very weird. To me, that's a big insight into you, perhaps, because you obviously grew up with the books and love them, mm -hmm. and uh, you receive awards for for working with gender roles. And a lot of your stories examine gender roles in society and reverse them and turn them upside down and back forward. I'm, I'm very interested in those issues. Right. Yeah, um, uh, I've written a lot of stories that are about. Uh, it seems to me that there's a lot of story, fiction, science fiction, and fantasy that deals with female roles. Okay, uh, and there, you know, of course, these stories have a lot to say about male roles as well, but I don't know that the idea of masculinity and what masculinity is and what it what its history is and what it ought to be and you know what what is a man? What is a man supposed to be? Uh, you know, in some ways that's been under challenge in our, our culture for some time. And so uh, I'd like to write about that. Uh, you know, um, little boys are always told, you know, be a man. But uh, and that used to be pretty simple to figure out. You know, play football, be strong, don't cry, you know, uh, boss other people around, take charge, all those things. But, uh, you know, what does it mean to be a man now? Or what ought it mean to be a man? And, and if, if uh, in a, in a, in a post-feminist world, you know, is there such a thing as masculinity anymore? And, and how would you define it or redefine it? That's very interesting to me. Definitely. That's a... Uh... Cut that short, unfortunately. That's all right. And, and move on. But uh, someday, I'd like to come back. You, get, to you drop a nickel here. I'm going to just yeah. talk. Okay, that's no, what I do. it's fantastic. <laughs> it's fantastic. I mean, I, I always need uh, my interviewee to carry, carry it because I don't have terribly much to add. But um, thank you very much. It's, uh, like I said, I, I hope that would be an insight into where you're writing from because I know the 
your your collection had several stories that kind of examined mm -hmm. examined that. Well, anyway, I'm going to give this talk at the Regulator on mm -hmm. I think it's the 13th of of, of April right. about uh, Wicked and mm -hmm. Oz, Oz books. All right. Uh, let's talk next about uh, your job here as a creative in the creative writing program. Um, I was very happy to accept my first story, uh, a story from one of your former students, Peter Wood, and another former student of yours, the uh, NCSU Master in Creative Writing graduate, Michael Jasper. Uh, you wrote an introduction for his, his um, st story collection, Gunning for Buddha, and his novel, A Gathering of Doorways, I was able to excerpt in the first issue. Um, so that's two of your issues, writing in the area at least. What do you hope to impart upon your students in the short time you have them, and how do you judge yourself as a professor of science fiction mm -hmm. writing? Well, one of the things I like, uh, uh, I feel privileged, is that I am a professor of creative writing in a, you know, a graduate program, and I'm also a science fiction and fantasy writer. And I am not put off by students who want to write science fiction and fantasy in, in, the, in the context of a writing program, which a lot of college professors are not crazy about, and they don't, they don't know much about it. And I know a lot about it. So uh, when I get a student who wants to write this stuff, I, I get excited, and I want to. I, I just sort of uh, I like to work with them. I like to encourage them. I, I'm always like shoving books in front of their faces saying, read this, read this, or think about this. I always challenge them. I want them to write well, because my, my sort of my, my project as a professor has been, for as long as I've been one, 30 years or more, uh, is to try to raise the uh, respect level and the the literacy, the literature level of, of science fiction and fantasy. And I think it's, you know, a lot of great science fiction and fantasy have been written for 100, 100 years or more, but a lot of people are ignorant of it. So one, one half of my career is as a teacher of literature is to sort of proselytize for this kind of fiction and understand how it works and, you know, study it. The other part of me as a teacher of writing is to, one, write it as well as I can myself, two is uh, encourage uh, young writers to, to write it better. And so uh, I really liked working with Mike Jasper. Uh, another of my graduates uh, from the MA program was Andy Duncan. I don't know if you know him. He's yeah. been nominated for the World Fantasy Hugo and Nebula Awards many times. Uh, won the World Fantasy Award twice, and uh, he was here in the mid mid 90s, just a little before Mike Jasper. Uh, he had a, a book come out in like 2000 called Duluth Hatchie and Other Stories. And the title story was written here when he was a master's student, and now he's got a new collection coming out from I think it's from Nightshade Books, uh, um, sometime next year. So um, I know I you know I, I really like like to do that. Uh, to, to, to work with these guys. It's, it's uh, you know, I, one of the tricks is, is to, on the one hand, you want to encourage them them to write their own stuff. On the other hand, you want to sort of provide a sounding board and maybe uh, uh, challenge them to, you know, whether what they're doing is the best they can do. And, and it's the sort of thing, I don't want to prescribe to them, oh, you can't do that. But I also don't want to just sort of leave them without any, any guidance at all. So it's sort of like a back and forth thing. It's a, a good segue. You mentioned wanting to kind of raise the literary quality of, of science fiction, and The Pride of Prometheus is a great example of that because obviously you, you borrowed from two masters of literature. Yeah, um, uh, Mary Shelley and Jane Austen. And yeah. um, that the merging of the, the very science fictional Frankenstein story with the very literature-based Pride and Prejudice uh, kind of blending it in and, yeah. and adopting the style. What, what I've read of, of reviews of your collections are you have a, a, an unmistakable quality of being able to adapt your writing tone, your writing style to fit the story. Mm -hmm. And in that case, it was it was obviously roundly recognized. You won you won the Nebula for it um, as being able to just really pull off that tone and writing of Jane Austen. Well, I was I was trying to do Jane Austen and some Mary Shelley too. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, someone else will have to say whether I did it as well as I might, but I, I did as 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 well as I, I I could, and and I do I I do take pride in the fact that my style isn't the same in every story, and that I will try to change what I'm doing depending on what the story requires, and and, uh, and I have certain uh, concerns that I come back to over and over again, but. But um, you know, I I I I really am interested in the craft of writing, and I think of of writing as a, I mean, there's a lot of inspiration and intuition that goes into it, but there's also a sense in which you have to be a good bricklayer. You have to know how to build the house so that it won't fall down, and uh, that the the doors are are square and the and the, the
the floors are level and and you know it's well ventilated and 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 you know that's why I want to I want to build stories like that that are are well constructed and they they may not always be elegant or beautiful but I, I want you to be able to live in them <laughs> without them falling apart. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I, I work hard at that. I don't. I'm not a tremendously prolific writer, but I do. Uh, I do do want to do that. And I guess I'm very influenced by uh, classic writers. So I've written a number of stories that uh, I've borrowed from. Some people say st stolen from <laughs> the classics. Uh, it's sort of a challenge to you know. I mean, to try to write a Jane Austen story is probably foolish because she was a brilliant writer. One thing I liked about that story was that, and as I worked into it, I really got to think about it, is that you know Mary Shelley is sort of the ancestor of science fiction, and Jane Austen is one of the the, the progenitors of the modern uh, you know uh, uh, novel of manners, you might call it. Okay, and and uh, and so they were, and they both wrote at the same time, and so the idea that they're putting them together in one story is that there's a real conflict between them, uh, you know. Austin is kind of of a satirist and uh, and an observer of uh, culture and and uh, you know the the way human beings behave. Uh, Shelley's more of a gothic writer who's uh, very much more romantic and not at all a, a satirical. Uh, and and so they don't really fit together naturally. But but it's sort of like it is sort of like talking about the juncture between science fiction and non science fiction. Uh, and and how they they might fit together and how they they might not fit together. Well, well, well continuing to pound this this uh, mainstream fiction or literary fiction and science fiction, um, the slipstream anthology feeling very strange. Mm -hmm. um, you, you're making the case for the convergence of mainstream fiction and, and literary science fiction is kind of how the secret history of science fiction is kind of tagged. But what, back when you edited the slipstream anthology. Um, how did that prepare you to do the next stage that you, that you put well, together? Well, actually, uh, these three anthologies I've done with, uh, co-edited with James Patrick Kelly. Here's the, the, the Secret History, which is, just came out in October. This is the last one, a little advertisement. Um, all three of them, I think, are, are in the same ballpark, and that all three of them were you know, a Slipstream book, which came out, I think, in 07, was it, or 06? And at any rate, uh, it was, uh, you know, slipstream is a term that was uh, invented by Bruce Sterling in 1989 to talk about a certain kind of story. And the term has been adopted by other people, and there's considerable argument about what it, what it means and what is a slipstream story and what isn't. Uh, in, some ways, uh, in some ways, I think the kind of fiction that Sterling's talking about had been around long before he he described it and uh, you know under other terms like surrealism or you know some people say magic realism I'm not crazy about that term uh, so so we were and and this kind of story is being written by what you might call people who are, are generally perceived to be fantasy writers or science fiction writers but also by uh, writers who are not associated with science fiction fantasy literary writers and so uh, we wanted to show how at least in the last 15 years that the, there's a kind of uh, a emerging genre uh, that is not is so firmly associated with with uh, pulp fiction versus uh, literary fiction. And then uh, the the next book we did the cyberpunk book, po the sort of post cyberpunk anthology called Rewired. Again, uh, cyberpunk is a kind of science fiction that is read by a lot of people who don't normally read science fiction. And people like uh, William, writers like William Gibson and Neil Stevenson have an audience uh, far outside of just science fiction readers. So that also, and you know, uh, you mentioned Paolo Bacigalupi, he has a story in there, Cory Doctorow, mm -hmm. some contemporary writers who really are are uh, bending the, the edges of, of genre. And then this book, The Secret History, we really went out to get out, get um, writers who are not at all considered science fiction writers, uh, Margaret Atwood and uh, T.C. Boyle and Michael Shaban, Don DeLillo, uh, you know, um, George Saunders, Stephen Milhauser, these are all writers who never have been called science fiction writers. But we have stories in here by them which we think by at least some definition of the term can be called science fiction. So we're making the argument that that this kind of uh, fiction, we would call it surrealism, magic realism, slipstream, uh, literary science fiction, that the, that the border is getting fuzzy and it's not completely permeable. It still is pretty much the case that if you call something a science fiction story, there are a lot of people who will not read it. 
Okay, <laughs> they, they 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 will think oh, I know what science fiction is. It's aliens. It's spaceships. It's Star Wars. I don't like that stuff. I don't read it. Uh, well, there's a lot of science fiction. There always has been that is not alien spaceships and Star Wars, and uh, we're we're trying to to show that uh, you know that it, it's it's still going strong and and it's uh, uh, you know uh, uh, a credible kind of fiction. So actually, I, I was just at the uh, uh, International Conference on the Fantastic and the Arts last mm -hmm. week in Florida and talked to the publisher of the Secret History, uh, Tachyon Books, the editor, the publisher, uh, uh, Jacob Wiseman. And he's af after Jim and me to do a, a, a kind of a prequel to this book where we cover science fiction or writing from 1950 to 1970. This book starts in 1971 mm -hmm. and goes to the present. Uh, 1950 to 1970, and and uh, and again show how there's a uh, was crossover fiction uh, even back then. Wow. Uh, so you mentioned coming back from IFA. Um, you're also heading to Fractal in Medellin. Yeah. Um, what what is Fractal about for people who don't know? Well, Fractal is a, a a kind of arts literature. Uh, it's, it doesn't a music festival that takes place in Medellin, Colombia. The first year was last year and it was quite successful and it drew in all kinds of things I mean it had things you would never expect at a science fiction in some ways it was a science fiction convention but it wasn't just a science fiction convention and or it broadened the term to cover a whole lot of different things so for instance they had a fashion show there it turns out Medellin I didn't know this is a is a center of a couture uh, you know uh, uh, international center for fashion and so uh, there were students at the university there who are in this program to study fashion design and clothing design, and so they they had a, a science fiction fashion show where they asked uh, uh, the students. They gave them some cyberpunk uh, texts, and they said, "Okay." Uh, and they gave it to them on Monday, and then by Thursday they had to produce clothing that would be inspired by these uh, texts. And then they had this fashion show, which was very bizarre. And they had, you know, they had a, a you know a rock band from from Kali and one of the other cities in Colombia, and uh, they had a they had a, um, um, a kind of a tango ballet they had a performance by the symphony orchestra and they had science fiction writers me and James Patrick Kelly they had a, a science fiction editor from Argentina a writer from Spain and and uh, 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 all of these things in in the same place and so they're doing it again this year at the end of April and um, the the theme this year is uh, What's it called? Uh, reinventing the future, um, and I think that in you know Colombia, which is you know a country that has certainly had a sad history in some ways, uh, political and you know uh, other difficulties. Uh, you know, there it impressed me, especially Medellin, a city that's you know mostly people know about it as a center of drug trade. Uh, there's a sort of attempt to uh, see past the kind of difficulties of the past and, 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 and reinvent the future. So, um, you know, the people who run this are very young and very idealistic, and, uh, and I really like the international flavor of it, the idea that, you know, that we talk across. Uh, it really impressed me. One thing that impressed me most is it made me embarrassed, too, is that I don't, I don't speak Spanish and that that embarrassed me that I couldn't speak their language. But the other thing was that they knew an awful lot about American fiction. They'd read tons of it. Hmm. I knew very little about Colombian fiction, and I felt sort of embarrassed. I was one of these sort of ignorant Yankees. Uh, you know, I'd read I'd read Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and that was it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it turns out there's lots of stuff going on there that I didn't know about. Excellent. Um, there's actually a really interesting um, International Books Translation Award uh, that's kind of making its rounds right now, and it's, I'm hearing a lot about it. Have mm. you been following that? I, I, don't, I don't know that, no. Okay. I, the names, of course, escape me right now that we're on a, a camera, but um, I'll try to send it to you afterwards because right? it sounds like you might be very interested. Okay. And basically, they just, they just task all these editors from all across the world with putting forward the best books from their country in that year. Huh. And then they kind of they all get translated and they all get read and hundreds and hundreds of books get read and, and all the, that kind of thing. The Science Fiction Writers of America a couple of years ago put out a book called the European Science Fiction European Hall of Fame, which is uh, science fiction written all, all, all of the, it must be like 12 or 13 different countries of Europe, mm. uh, uh, all translated into English in this book. And, uh, you know, it's a pretty interesting book. Uh, and, and it shows you that this kind of stuff is going on uh, 
everywhere. And we, we tend to be, you know, English overall, overall is, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we don't know about other places. And so I think it's a good, I mean, it really is, the world is getting smaller and this whole idea of globalization, uh, whatever you think about, you know, the economics of it, uh, culturally, it seems to me that, that we are, um, you know, crossing a lot of borders. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's wrap up talking about um, the Sycamore Hill Writers' Conference. Um, it's something that, that you've probably been a part of for 25 years of getting together and writing and collaborating and workshopping. You mentioned that you're not uh, running it this year, but uh, can you tell me about what's going to happen this year? Yeah, uh, well, it started in uh, like 1985, I think, was the first time we did it. And Mark Van Name and I organized it and ran it here in Raleigh. And then Mark and I ran it for five years, and then we took a break, and then ran it a couple other years, and then Mark uh, dropped out, and Richard Butner and I uh, started uh, uh, running it, and uh, did it through uh, the mid-aughts, and then Richard took over uh, like three years ago, and I'm, I'm no longer running it. But it's a retreat uh, slash workshop where what happens is it's it's by invitation the writers have to be published writers already uh, they come to the uh, we we live in some place to set apart you know, for a while here it was in North Hall across the street or or in the uh, a house at the Governor Moorhead School for the Blind or then for a while it was up at a, a house at Bryn Mawr College in in Pennsylvania and most recently it's been at the Wild Acres. Uh, retreat center in the western North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, 10 to 15 writers come, everyone brings a, a work in progress, a, a new manuscript, and you, you hand them around and you set a schedule for the week and you critique the stories. And uh, a lot of wonderful stories have come out of it. Uh, um, and many, many uh, of my generation of writers uh, uh, have been at Sycamore Hill over the years, including you know, some pretty famous ones like uh, you know, uh, Connie Willis and uh, Bruce Sterling and uh, um, um, Nancy Kress and Maureen McHugh and Ted Chang. And so, uh, you know, it's a, it's just a very stimulating thing. This year, uh, since Richard took over, the clientele's changed somewhat. And I, th I like that, that he's, he's sort of brought in, um, for one thing, he's brought in a lot of younger writers that I don't know as well. So uh, writers like this, this year, I think uh, Megan McCarran will be there and Alice Kim, two fairly new, new writers in, in science fiction and fantasy. Uh, um, Ted Chang will be there. Karen Joy Fowler, m remarkable novelist, not a, not a kid anymore. Uh, uh, I'm going to be there. Uh, Richard will be there. Uh, Christopher Rowe, a wonderful writer. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, last year, Paolo Bacigalupi was there. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's you know, Richard is also very good at the gender balance. He's always has half women and half men. So that's a, that's a good thing too. Um, anyway, so, um, it's also very stimulating to sort of clash of what, you know, what, what's the best kind of writing to do? How do you do this? What's new? What's, what's old? Uh, been a heavy influence in the last te decade from a writer named Kelly Link. Do you know Kelly Link? I don't know Kelly. She got her M MFA at Greensboro back in the 90s, and she lives up in Massachusetts now, but she's published only short stories, never a novel, but she's published some amazingly influential short stories, and she's read by a lot of people. Okay. She also, he, she and her husband, Gavin Grant, uh, run a, a, a small press called Small Beer Press, and uh, they publish you know, a few books a year, but they're always very good books and very strange books. And they also publish a magazine called Lady Churchill's Rosebud Wristlet. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of your competitors, really. <laughs> uh, and so Kelly, uh, I don't know if she'll be there this year, but she's been there frequently. All right, well, thanks very much, John. I hope we can catch up again sometime and talk about the next anthology or whatever else oh, you're well, up to. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for coming by, and uh, uh, best of luck with the magazine. All right, thank you. All right. Well, thanks for hopefully you've enjoyed this issue of the Bullspec Video Interviews podcast. Tune in next time. Thank you.